Good morning, everybody. And I want to start just by saying that despite some really heroic efforts on the part of the crew here, presentation is not going to have audio this morning. Sorry about that. So I'm going to need help with sound effects, despite karaoke last night. So because there's some few key points in this presentation that need emphasis with sound. So uh, my name is Jeff Norris, and I'm really happy to be here. I hope everyone's having a great conference. Uh, we're all software people, and we came here primarily to learn about software. But this morning, I'm going to talk about something that I think is equally important in our work, which is partnership. I'm going to tell you three stories of how partnership has shaped inventions from the great eras of exploration, sea, air, and space. And I'm going to draw some lessons from those stories about how we should be forming partnerships in our own work today. So, because we're getting a little bit of a late start, let's get started. My first story is from the era of maritime exploration. It is a time of great uncertainty in navigation. Our maps are confused by the fact that we don't really know where we are at any particular time. Our position in a vessel is often up to the guess of a ship's navigator, and they often guess wrong with disastrous effects. And in 1707, the British government loses four warships and 2,000 men when the admiral of that fleet can't correctly determine the location of their boat. This brings the empire to a point of desperation, and they form, they charter a new board of longitude, and they offer the Longitude Prize, 20,000 pounds, or about five and a half million dollars, for the person who can bring the first practical solution to the Board of Longitude for finding longitude at sea, or your position from east to west on a map. You see, latitude was never really the problem. You can find your latitude, well, if you're an early mariner, even with a stick and a string held between your teeth. And with something like this sextant here, you can find it quite accurately. So, a sextant is actually a uh, device that we use to measure the angles of things above a horizon or the angles between celestial bodies. So I'm just going to use my sextant here right now to measure the angle here of the sun over the horizon and uh, figure out the time of day, which is something that a mariner would have to do quite often with the sextant and it's something that it's quite good at accomplishing. In fact, if you were to measure the altitude of the star Polaris, or the North Star, over the horizon, you would actually have your latitude on Earth in the Northern Hemisphere. So the ease with which people could find latitude using something like a sextant is, makes it unsurprising that when they wanted to find longitude that they also looked to the sky. So you may have noticed that the moon moves across the sky from east to west just like the sun and the stars. What you may not have noticed, however, is that it moves across the sky a little bit slower. So you can see, so it kind of just moves this way. But the uh, reason why it moves a little bit slower is that it's orbiting the Earth from west to east, the opposite direction. Not fast enough to make it look like it's going the opposite direction, but fast enough to make it look like it slides across the sky against the background of stars behind it. So, when you're looking up at that as a mariner, if you had a sextant, you could use that sextant to measure the angle in between the sun, sorry, the moon, and a reference star like Regulus. And if you could find that angular distance, then you could find the linear apparent visual distance between that star and the moon. This is called the lunar distance, and it's critical in our first story, because with the lunar distance, you can calculate longitude. It's actually pretty simple. All you got to do is just account for the altitudes of the two objects in the sky because that causes aberrations in their appearance. And don't forget the apparent diameter of the moon because you see the moon changes its apparent diameter as it moves around in its orbit around the Earth. And you also need to uh, uh, make some corrections for parallax because the moon looks different from different places on Earth. Just plug all that into some simple systems of trigonometric equations, which unfortunately, that's not quite right. I, I think it's more like this one. but. Um, and you don't have a calculator on your boat, you're going to have to look up all these trig functions in a table uh, because, you know, calculators haven't been invented yet. And while you're doing this, you know, the wind is blowing, the sea is, is churning, and the moon is moving up and down. And, you know, the problem with, that I'm just describing here is why even a skilled ski, sea captain couldn't find longitude in less than four hours at sea and why we need an alternative. And we do have an alternative. You see, on Earth, 
the sun is setting at one place at really one point during a day in any given day. And so it's like the, the sunset line is crossing over the earth almost like the hand of a clock. And if you're out here somewhere in the middle of the North Atlantic and you happen to know that the sun just set, so you just saw that sun drop below the horizon, and by some magical ability, if you knew that in London the sun had set exactly two hours ago, you would know your longitude on Earth because there's 360 degrees around the globe, it takes 24 hours a day for the sun to go around, so each 15 degrees equals one hour of difference. So if it's set two hours ago, well then all you gotta do is go 15 degrees for one hour and 15 degrees for the next hour. You're 30 degrees away from London. This is actually the same as if you happened again to magically to know what time it is where you are, and I just showed you how you do that with a sextant, and what time it is where you left from. So how do you do that second part? Well, you're probably thinking, oh, I just need to bring a clock, right? No big deal. Well, the problem is, is that clocks of the time don't function very well on the rocking boats that were trying to cross the ocean. And so uh, that, unfortunately, is, is not going to work uh, with the technology of the time. However, these are what would become the two main likely approaches for solving the longitude problem. The lunar and distance method and the chronometer, or a really accurate clock. And I'd like you to introduce you to the two gentlemen who are the leading proponents of each approach. So, on the left, over here, we have Neville Maskelyne. He is a member of the British elite intelligentsia, a master astronomer, formally educated, and all in on the lunar distance method. He's an astronomer, and he believes that's the way to solve the problem. Over on the right, we have a country carpenter by the name of John Harrison. He taught himself a little bit of science on the side, fixes a few clocks in his spare time. This probably doesn't feel like too much of a fair fight master astronomer, country carpenter. It's not, it's really not a fair fight. But don't count John out just yet because he's got a couple tricks up his sleeve still. <laughs> so, Neville Maskelyne over here, he's got some really powerful friends, including Sir Isaac Newton, who tells the world lunar distance is the only method worth looking at when trying to solve the longitude problem. In fact, he is the de facto head of the Board of Longitude. Um, he's also the head of the community of astronomers who have convinced the British Crown to build this. This is the uh, Greenwich Observatory, which you can just think of it as a, a temple to astronomy. It is a veritable castle, okay? The royal astronomers actually lived there. And they justified it at expense by saying, oh, build this for us and we'll solve the longitude problem. Well, John over here on the right John Harrison, he didn't get that memo. Maybe he didn't travel in royal society circles enough, but he spent the next five years of his life building a sea clock, and this is what he made. And I want you to just take a moment to appreciate the incredible artistry and the amazing craftsmanship in his sea clock. Uh, there are many advances in this clock for timekeeping of the time, a revolutionary escapement. Uh, parts of this clock are actually made of wood, and they exude a natural oil that lubricates the clock as it runs. Uh, it doesn't use pendulums. It uses a, uh, a system of springs and counterweights uh, in order to keep time at sea. Rather important, again, because his clock has to work on a rocking boat. So, John finishes his sea clock, brings it to the Board of Longitude, and demands the sea trial, which is a condition of claiming the longitude prize. It has to go across the Atlantic and back again and correctly determine the position of the boat while it does so. They deny him this. They instead say, well, you've got to do a pre-trial. We're not so sure about this contraption you've built. So he goes to Lisbon on a boat instead with a, a fleet. It goes very well. On his way back, he's credited with saving that fleet from disastrous end on a group of rocks called the Manacles south of Dead Man's Point. But and he probably should have right then said, you know what, I'm ready. I'm ready to go across the ocean. I'm ready to, to have my real trial. But he didn't. He was, I guess, a little bit unsatisfied with his first creation. Now, what do you do when you're not entirely satisfied with your creation that you spent five years on? You know, maybe make a few tweaks. Not John. John abandons it, 
and builds a completely new clock. A new clock that would be his second uh, C clock. And it's a marvelous machine in its own right, a lot more advances. And then he discovers, after five years of working on it, that there's another flaw in it that he maybe would have still allowed him to win the Longitude Prize, but he decides it's not good enough and he's going to have to uh, make some more adjustments. And again, what do you do after you've made your second clock and now you've spent over 10 years of your life building clocks? Uh, well, you spend 17 years building your third clock. I want you to think about spending 17 years basically uncompensated. He lived a meager existence doing a little bit of carpentry and clock repair in order to make ends meet but basically spent all of his time trying to build this third C clock. This whole time, the proponents of the lunar distance method over here, and this is the uh, royal astronomer James Bradley, and his friends, Neville Maskelin and others, they're working this whole time trying to make the lunar distance method work, and they still haven't quite gotten it to be easy enough for a ship captain to accomplish. Uh, and right about now, the story's gonna start getting a little a little bit dirty because uh, James Bradley uses his position as the royal astronomer and the head of the Board of Longitude to delay the testing of Harrison's third sea clock. He's trying to buy time for his friend Neville Maskeline to finish those tables so that they can win the prize. In fact, Bradley is a competitor for the Board of Longitude prize and he's the chairman of the Board of Longitude. Just a slight conflict of interest, you might say. Now, all these delaying tactics from Bradley over here, I'm afraid they backfired just a little bit because during these delays, John Harrison finishes what would become his masterpiece, which is that. Now, you're saying, wait, that doesn't look anything like the stuff you just showed us. It doesn't. It doesn't look like the work of the same person. He has figured out how to compress all of that gangly apparatus down into something that's basically a large pocket watch. And all these delays by Bradley and company really only ensure that John has time to finish that, the fourth sea clock, and that is the thing that will go across the ocean to be tested, and so it does. It's actually John's son, William, that goes across the ocean to Barbados with the fourth sea clock. It performs miraculously well. It loses only a few seconds in an entire ocean crossing voyage. It determines the location of that boat far more accurately than anyone else on that boat can. So they arrive, jubilant, and actually the captain of that vessel is so excited that he awards William Harrison an octant, which is a bit like saying, well, we're not gonna need that old thing anymore. <laughs> it was the trophy of the vanquished foe. So all that's left is that basically the Harrisons just need to have some final certification from the Board of Longitude, both in Barbados and then when they return to London. And so they're in Barbados and they know they need to meet an expert from the Board of Longitude. I wonder who they'll pick. I wonder who's the expert that they'll bring. Neville Maskeline. Why is he in Barbados anyway? Oh, he's there testing his method, trying to win the prize. So the guy who is going to determine if their clock has worked is the guy who is their direct, com direct competitor for the prize. Yeah, even Neville is forced to accept that yes, the clock has worked, and so he sends them back to London, he heads back to London, and then something happens. The royal astronomer dies. A new one must be appointed. Who are they gonna pick? You guessed it, Neville Maskelyne. Neville immediately uses his position now as the head of the Board of Longitude, not to award the prize to the victorious John Harrison, but to change the rules. John is told, sorry, you've satisfied all of the conditions that in the old Longitude Prize, but the new Longitude Prize you see requires that you also surrender all of the designs for your clock. You have to take it apart and put it back together again in front of an expert panel, including your competitors, rival clockmakers. You also need to build two more of them. So by the way, those diagrams and drawings that Neville Maskeline stole from uh, John Harrison. He then turned around and published to the public, literally put them to press and sent them away. And uh, the joke was on him a little bit about that. Uh, I mean, think about your intellectual property being handled that way with no legal recourse to it. Uh, but the problem was is that John really was terrible at expressing himself in writing or in drawings, and those diagrams were indecipherable and no one could figure them out. <laughs> they might as well have been encrypted. So. They, <laughs> 
to make everything worse, Neville Maskelyne now arrives at the front door of John Harrison with a written order from the Board of Longitude saying, you must surrender all of your clocks to me at once for testing. This is outright robbery. He walks away, in a carriage away, with 20 plus years of John Harrison's life work takes them back to Greenwich and tests them under ridiculous conditions, finds them unsuitable. You may be thinking that John Harrison has been awfully misused in this situation. Fortunately, he was not entirely alone. He appeals to King George III. You know things are bad when the monarch has got to get involved. He is outraged at the treatment of John Harrison. He orders the Board of Longitude to make it right. And they award most of the money that John was actually due. But they do not confer the honor of the winning of the Longitude Prize. They, in fact, dissolve the committee rather than award that to John, which is a big jerk move. And <laughs> so you may be uh, feeling a little let down right about now, because you know I promised you guys a story of partnership, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is a story of the disastrous lack of partnership. And you know, Neville's coming across as a villain, and he does deserve that, that a little bit in this story. But John did not help matters either. You see, John ex insisted on working basically alone. He trusted no one. And uh, the problem with that was is that though he had a spark of genius, he was terrible at expressing himself in writing, he was terrible at politics, couldn't sell things, he didn't have the full package necessary to bring his invention to the world. And that's probably why it took him practically 30 years to pull this off. I want you to imagine what these two gentlemen could have accomplished in a partnership. They're all the makings of an amazing partnership here, the master astronomer, a clockmaker. They both care about the same problem. They come from different backgrounds. They could have accomplished great things. Imagine what they could have built. Well, I don't have to imagine, because it is the union of their two approaches that guide every spacecraft that I help to operate at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. On the left, a modern star tracker on the right, the Deep Space Atomic Clock, which is going to be launched soon. Every spacecraft needs celestial navigation and extremely accurate timekeeping to know where it is as it voyages across space. So reconciliation for these two gentlemen, I'm afraid, was to be found many years later and in the stars. But before we talk about space further, I have to take us to our next story, and our next story is about aviation. It's 200 years later. The Wright brothers just made their first flight. And aviation is at a very vulnerable time because most people look at this as a ridiculous circus act. And there's a reason for that because most people see aviation for the first time in a traveling show, uh, mini shows wandering the country called Barnstormers. And so they would come out and they'd watch people walk on wings and parachute and do weird acrobatics. And so basically convincing the whole world that only an idiot would get into an airplane. <laughs> and a hotel owner by the name of Raymond Ortigue decides to help correct this problem. He creates a new prize, the Ortigue Prize, so the second prize of our, of our discussion this morning. His prize is a bit smaller. It's only about $350,000 in today's dollars. But the prize is to be awarded, and all the glory that comes with it, for the first uh, person or people to make a nonstop flight between New York and Paris uh, either direction. Now, to just explain how ridiculous of a notion that was perceived at the time, let me show you what a plane looked like in this time. So, this is the de Havilland Tiger Moth. It is made of wood and fabric, all held together with a bunch of glue and rope. I am not kidding. It's a two-seater, single-engine biplane, and uh, you might be asking yourself, like, what kind of a foolhardy individual would decide to climb aboard one of these things for a flight? Well, me, because it happens that my dad owned a tiger moth when I was young, and I flew many times in this, and I want to tell you just a little bit about what that's like. It is about as unlike modern aviation as you could possibly imagine. It is loud, it is windy, the thing is shaking all the time, you think it's going to just come apart. The needles are dancing in the dials, so you can only estimate your airspeed between, I don't know, 60 to 75-ish or so. And it's quite normal, by the way, to be flying along, watching the cars going fast, faster than you um, in a strong headwind. 
the whole experience is punctuated by the smell of gasoline, because I'm pretty sure that every tiger moth in the world has a leaky fuel tank. But it is an amazing experience. It is a far more romantic era of aviation. When you start it, it sounds a little bit like, oh, we don't have sound effects, sorry. <laughs> I want you to imagine right now the sound of a machine that you would not trust to mow your lawn, okay? <laughs> With that in your head, that's what it sounded like. And you brought that sound about by walking up to the front of the plane, grabbing on the propeller, and pulling really hard. So, so that is what aviation was like at the time. Now, one of the things that the early de Havilland planes were used for is delivering the very first airmail in this country. And I happen to have a little bit of airmail here. And I'm going to tell you a few things about the airmail and some of the people who started it. So um, the first pilot for the second airmail route in the United States, none other than this gentleman, someone you've heard of, his name was Charles Lindbergh. There he is. Charles was no stranger to the dangers of early aviation. He was a barnstormer, so he went around walking on wings and doing crazy things like that. When he became one of the first airmail pilots, oh, by the way, I almost forgot. I just have to show you evidence. This is me and my dad on the tiger moth. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> um, the, uh, Charles, when he was one of those first airmail pilots, actually managed to crash not one but two of the first airmail planes had his life saved twice by, pa by parachute, by jumping out with a parachute. Uh, this is Charles right here who looks rather inappropriately proud of, <laughs> of the mess he's caused. So Charles, while he's flying these late night air mail routes, decides I gotta compete for the Board of Longitude Prize. And uh, that's, um, uh, sorry, not the Board of Longitude, for the Ortigue Prize. That would be rather remarkable. Um, <laughs> No, he's thinking about this in the middle of the night as he's flying on these airmail routes. Now, in order to do that, he's got to have a plane. And so he convinces some people in St. Louis to give him some money, heads to New York to try to buy a plane to compete for the Ortigue Prize. Now, I want to mention, by this time, the Ortigue Prize has expired its first five years. It's been reissued because literally no one tried in the first five years. So in this next round, people think someone's going to pull it off. So there are a lot of aircraft companies already getting into place. And they are all refusing to sell Charles Lindbergh a plane because He's nobody. He's not a trusted member of aviation. One uh, aircraft company says, sure, we'll sell you a plane, but you can't fly it. I mean, after all, Charles hadn't even flown over water at this point. He's talking about flying across the ocean. Another place said, uh, well, we'll only sell you a multi-engine plane. And Charles felt pretty strongly that a single-engine plane was the way to go with this. And it's actually a brilliant example of, of risk tolerance engineering because he realized that multi-engine plane, while it might be able to emergency land over land if it lost an engine. If you're in the middle of the ocean, it's not going to save your life. And for that reason, a single point of failure is still a single point of failure, and it only becomes worse if you multiply it by two or three. So he comes back from New York without a plane. He's pretty dejected because he's only got one option left. He already ruled out the option because it was from a team that he felt was just too inexperienced, too unproven. It sounds a bit like him, frankly. But um, that person that he telegrams is this guy, Donald Hall. And the telegram is pretty amazing because, you know, they only had 140 characters, right? So they, uh, <laughs> they sent that telegram and it basically says, can you build a plane to fly nonstop from New York to Paris in two months? And uh, <laughs> Donald Hall says, sure. <laughs> so begins a true partnership. Oh, thank goodness, a real partnership. So these two gentlemen, they, um, Charles, comes to uh, California, where the Ryan Aircraft Company is, and they share an office, okay? They're basically not separated for two months. And a lot's been said about this gentleman's endurance in his cross-Atlantic flight, which should be um, celebrated. But this guy, the engineer, the chief designer of the Spirit of St. Louis, the, the lead of the team that built it, he spent 36 hours at his desk on a number of occasions trying to produce the designs quickly enough so that the mechanics building the plane could keep working. Here's one of the designs, actually, that he drew. And I want to just also point out that these guys were never deterred by minor problems. So they built the wing bigger than anything they'd ever built before, and it wouldn't fit out the door. So 
rather than knocking the wall out, and they were seriously considering just knocking the wall down in order to get the, the plane wing out, they noticed that there's a box car off to the side of their factory. And so they send a crew of guys to go push the box car underneath the second story window and then walk the plane out onto the box car and lower it to the ground. And you know what's remarkable? I bet the decision to do this took about two minutes. It wasn't like, let's have a meeting and do a bunch of trade analyses about how to get the, nope, just, come on guys, let's go push the box car. We're taking the wing out the window. Um, here is Donald putting the plane's wing on with his, uh, his team. Uh, it shows you the kind of leader he was. Now, let's just take a quick look at the marvelous machine that Donald and his team made. Imagine more sound effects here. This is the spirit of St. Louis, all right? And first of all, I want to point out it's got a really unnaturally gangly wingspan because pretty much it is the heaviest uh, plane that's ever been built of this size. Pretty much every orifice and empty cavity in this thing is filled with fuel. It's, it's, that's perhaps the most important thing it's going to need to make this voyage. It's a single engine, as Charles Lindbergh had expected and wanted, but everything else pretty much has been stripped out of this thing. The, uh, lights have been taken off of it. They figured they wouldn't need those anyway. The uh, parachute that Charles Lindbergh always flew with is discarded for weight. While some other planes that were competing for the prize had couches and refrigerators, no joke, inside the plane, Charles would sit for 34 hours on a wicker chair in the plane. Another extreme engineering design decision that Donald Hall had to make is if you look here from this angle, you're going to notice that there are no windows in the front of the Spirit of St. Louis. Charles Lindbergh could not see where he was flying. He had to put his head out the window or use this makeshift periscope in order to see where he was going. These are just an example of the single-minded engineering that characterizes the spirit of St. Louis. Decisions that Donald Hall made which would make the difference because other teams were trying to take something that was designed to do something else and make it also make this historic flight. Donald and his team built a single-purpose device in order to accomplish it, which is a great lesson for all of us in, in great engineering. So I want to talk now not about Lindbergh's journey, but about what happened when he came home. Charles Lindbergh, when he returns, is basically the most famous person on Earth. Everywhere he goes, he is celebrated. There is a ticker tape parade for him. There is uh, badges pinned on his chest. Everybody either wants to be him or marry him. This is just one of the parades in New York. Songs are written about him. And as you're watching our, our friend Lucky Lindy, the eagle of the USA, riding through the streets of, of uh, New York being celebrated, I want you to notice something that's missing. Or rather, who's missing? Where's Donald Hall? Because let's just get something straight here. There is no way that Charles Lindbergh could have created the spirit of St. Louis. No way. And at least half of this accomplishment is an engineering achievement, to be able to fly a plane this distance. Never been accomplished before. So it's, uh, well, you might be thinking maybe Donald Hall just doesn't like to be famous, doesn't want to be famous. That's not it at all. Everybody likes to be famous. Uh, and he doesn't live a, a bad life. Like, he, uh, he's a moderately successful aircraft engineer but it seems that the world could only tolerate one star. Now, I will say that Charles didn't make things better uh, with things like this. So this postcard here, our hero, Captain Charles Lindbergh, and right underneath his portrait, you're gonna see, we did it. Now you may be thinking, great, he's giving credit to his friend, Donald Hall. Nope, he's talking about him and his plane. <laughs> he wrote a book called We, again, about the journey of him and his plane. He talks about it almost like it's a horse. Like he just found a colt out in the prairie and like raised it to a horse and then went riding across the Atlantic with it. What happened to the people who built this plane? Well, sorry guys, I've let you down again. You were expecting another story of partnership. This one was gonna be a good one, right? Well, it was a great partnership. This could not have been achieved with anything less than the combined efforts of Charles Lindbergh 
and Donald Hall, and everybody, by the way, who was working for Donald at the aircraft company. But credit in a partnership is not always just justly and equitably divided. And if that is chief upon our minds when we form a partnership, then the partnerships are doomed. It will not succeed. So I've told you two stories of partnership about some remarkable people. I'm now going to tell you a third story of partnership about a rather ordinary person, because it's me. And I just want to be clear that uh, by putting my story in the same talk as a talk about Lindbergh and John Harrison, I am not at all attempting to say that myself or the accomplishments that I'm going to describe about here measure up to theirs. It's just a topic that I happen to know very well, and it's very pertinent to our discussion today. So I will say, though, if you'll permit me, that while Lucky Lindy may have landed his spirit of St. Louis in the Smithsonian, my team landed our spirit on Mars. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, this is the Spirit of Mars rover, if, uh, if, if you didn't get the bad joke. The, uh, um, and I helped uh, build the control system that drives this rover and its um, sister Opportunity and the Curiosity Mars rover that followed it. And uh, I'm hoping this clock is accurate, by the way. Someone should tell me otherwise. The, uh, while I was helping to actually, I was working on the tactical operations team for the Spirit rover went right after it landed. And the whole time that I was helping to operate that rover, I was thinking about how we explore and how the ways we explore their planets are, at the time, they were quite different. And so here is how we explore. We know how people explore. We explore by going places. Presence, physical presence, seems to be something that is inexorably a part of exploration. Then it is a little bit disturbing that this is how we ask people to explore the planets. We peer at little screens and look at little pictures and then try to form models in our head. And to make things worse, there are lots of people doing this. And so they're all forming different models in their heads. And uh, we've actually done some research to prove that these models are flawed, not because of the brilliant people who are forming them, but because of the medium through which that they're looking at this other planet. What we really want is this. We want the natural abilities of these explorers to assist them, not hinder them, by making them feel like they're on Mars as they explore. This is a, uh, quite a challenge because the uh, torrent of images that come down, well, to say the least, they're a bit difficult to unscramble and put together into something that feels coherent. We do a lot of things to try to make that happen. Where, for example, we make maps or we reproject those images so that we can look at it from different angles. We make 3D renderings. But mostly, we spend our time looking at pictures like this. This is a 360-degree panorama of, taken by the Spirit rover at the Husband Hills. And I want you for a moment to just imagine that you are Matt Damon standing right there. <laughs> and because you need to fix something, um, you need to go over there. Okay, So get this in your head, and I want you to imagine the path that you're going to take to walk between those two locations. Imagine that you're there. Maybe you're thinking of a path that looks something like this. You know, I'm just going to kind of go around the rover there and go stand over on that side of it. Well, that would look a little ridiculous, even more ridiculous than the dust storm at the beginning of the movie, um, because all you really need to do is to look this way and go the other direction, because you're basically standing right beside that spot. And so you don't need to walk around the other way. So I already told you guys it was a 360-degree image, so you know I didn't trick you, right? Well, the the problem is, is that you're deprived of all of the natural instincts of, of points of reference that would offer you would have if you were in a place like this on Earth. It just looks like a bunch of rocks and dust. I mean, the rover, it looks pretty odd at the bottom there, but it's amazing how quickly your eyes just sort of glance over that and don't pay attention to that anymore. By the way, unless you were uh, incredibly large, you would not look like this. You'd be about that size, and you wouldn't grow as you walk from point to point and actually stay <laughs> about the same size. So, Basically, this is why this problem is hard. If I were to show you a, a more familiar place like an intersection in New York, it might at least be evident that there's something weird going on, but you would still have a problem because if I ask you to imagine going from that street over to that street and imagine which direction you have to turn and which way you have to go, it's another trick because you're already standing on that street. You just need to walk in a straight line up the street. Um, 
it doesn't actually help if everything is moving. Uh, so here you're out snowboarding with your friend, and he's going to do a really cool trick, which <laughs> that's a little weird. Maybe if you stand still, nope, still weird, OK. <laughs> um, the problem here is that your brains, my brains, all of our brains are not designed to view the world this way. And so it's a little troubling that we're all looking at it this way when we're exploring another planet. So what can we do? Where can we turn? Well, so as my, my recent personal snowboarding video shows, um, <laughs> we, uh, my team turns its attention to the domain of video games. Video games, right? We're, we're for NASA. What are we talking to video game companies for? Well, because video games are designed to make you feel like you're somewhere else. Their technologies, the devices you use to control it, the devices you use to look at these scenes are designed to make you feel like you're somewhere else. None more so than devices that you wear on your face, like a head-mounted display. So I'm going to do a little experiment with you. Again, imagine the rackety sound of a, of a roller coaster in the background. Not quite sure what this roller coaster is, but I really want to go there because look at this amazing view. Now, I want you just to stare intently at the screen for a second. And you know, do you feel something a little weird in your stomach? I mean, do you feel a little uh, you know, funny? Well, keep watching. Do you feel something different now? I bet you, you might. And that's kind of funny. I think it's a great example of just how simplistic our perceptions are. That just by expanding the size of this image that's covering up your retina, that we could make you feel differently about the environment that you're in. So what happens if we go the next step further? Don't just make the screen a little bigger. Put the screen everywhere. And then we'll just strap the screen to the face of a person who's terrified of roller coasters. Um, <laughs> so imagine a woman just shrieking in terror. And now imagine, well, you don't have to imagine, because her, her, her dear son is going to come into frame and say, it's, it's OK, mom. You're, you're all right. You're not going to die. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or, or this guy, by the way, I'm sure his friends were like, oh, it's going to be great. Just go try it out. It's fun. <laughs> He's screaming at the top of his lungs, get me out of here, get me out of here. By the way, I don't know why he doesn't just take the goggles off. But, um, <laughs> so if, if virtual reality can be used to terrify, to just horrify completely reasonable grown adults, and I bet you if you ask these guys, like they know they're in no mortal danger, but they're acting like they're terrified, that they're scared, something horrible is going to happen to them. If it can accomplish that amount of immersion, well then clearly it can do something similar for my team. So we form a series of partnerships. And basically, we have a partnership with just about everybody that makes something that you can strap to your face to look somewhere else. And we started with the Oculus, and we built some very early, this is several years old now, renderings of the environment of the Curiosity Mars rover. We did studies that showed that people's perceptions of the environment of the rover were far improved with this head-mounted display. Uh, we work with Sony, uh, the Sony Corporation. This is something we built in collaboration with them. Sorry for the kind of grainy capture. It looks much better than this in a headset. And then um, also a recent partnership with these people, Microsoft and the HoloLens. And uh, I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about this partnership because it has uh, a few lessons that I think draw together the stories that we've had throughout this talk and uh, helps us close up. So, when we first saw the HoloLens, and it was just a pile of wires and, and you know, not ready for prime time by any stretch of the imagination, we saw potential. And I went into the uh, uh, associate director's office at JPL and said, I need money <laughs> right now. And to his credit, he said, OK. Because literally next week, I moved a significant portion of my team to Redmond. And we lived there. We integrated our teams seamlessly together. We co-located like Donald Hall and Charles Lindbergh from the beginning and spent two months, just like the Donald Hall and the Charles Lindbergh um, story, which was, has been a great inspiration to me. Another inspiration to me was a story from eBay about how a small team of theirs went and sequestered themselves in Australia in order to build the new eBay homepage. And we took some lessons from those guys. When you uproot a whole team and you move them to another place, leaving behind their families and their, their you know, girlfriends and boyfriends and you know, all that behind, what do you do? Well, we rented a house. We lived together. Um, we tried to be a little bit of the family that you know, we had all left behind. We cooked together. We, um, and then we used that home to welcome our new colleagues in to uh, celebrate with us, to um, 
And we had poker games, we had barbecues, and what we were trying to do is to compress what would normally take years of team building down into like a week and a half. And we were able to do that. And you needed that because we had to come in that next Monday morning and say, I know you're trying really hard on this, this particular approach, but this isn't going to work. We've got to go a different direction. We have to make that okay. That's something you can say to someone you've known for years. And that's how we felt about each other quite quickly because of the measures that we took. Another great thing about this partnership is that we brought very different things to the table. They brought an expertise in human interactive systems, because most of that team, by the way, had its history in video game development, almost all of it, in fact. Um, and uh, my team, which brought the expertise in space exploration that they lacked, we were both going after a, a similar goal, which was to make people feel present in another environment for slightly different reasons. But we brought these different approaches, these different techniques together. And our cultures rubbed off on each other. There are practices that those teams taught me that we now employ on my team back at JPL, and vice versa is also true. Another thing I'm going to point out is that no money changed hands in this partnership. And when you're trying to think about how to structure a successful partnership, I want you to think about it. There are a lot of knobs you can turn to define a partnership. And if you fix the one labeled money at zero, not going either direction, and then just fiddle all of the other knobs, you might find that there's actually a great mutually benefit, ben, uh, ben, benefiting partnership that's present there. And boy, if you can fix that knob, it makes the paperwork a lot easier. <laughs> Speaking of paperwork, this partnership had almost no legal encumberment from the beginning. We basically got to work with nothing more than just a basic you know, agreement to, to work together. And uh, I think that's a lot like the spirit of St. Louis, actually, because I'm pretty sure they didn't start that two-month period with weeks of legal negotiation. They started by building a plane. That was the same attitude that we took. Lawyers got more involved later, but um, long after they could uh, you know, get in the way. So, um, so I need to close up here right now. And I want you to think about the opportunity that's available to you at this conference. I know you're here to learn about technology. I want you to think not only about the things you're encountering, but the people you're encountering. When you talk to them, don't just shake hands, say, hey, nice to meet you. Maybe I'll see you at the next one. Find out what they're doing. And think about what they're doing, what you're doing, and how those things could be done together. Because if my team can find a way to bring together a video game development team and a space exploration team to make something that we're all very proud of today, just imagine how many potentially successful alliances are in this room right now. So I hope you put those things together. I hope to hear about them. Please you know, stay in touch with me. I hope to hear whether you didn't like something about what I said. Um, and thank you very much for your attention.